Happy Easter. What an incredible day, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship here at FBC Kettering and the church at Eastmont. Uh, On Easter, we are combining services, and we're going to celebrate the risen Lord together. Uh, I'm excited about today. I'm excited about the fact that we're gathering uh, all over the world. One of the great things that's happened as a result of having to go online is that we've seen people tuning in to watch from literally across the world. 
And so my prayer for today is that not only will you be able to worship in your home with your family, but that others around the world will hear the gospel and that they might put their faith and trust in Jesus. I'm so glad that you've joined us today. It's going to be a great day. Pastor David is here with me. He's going to spend some time leading us in prayer, and uh, then we're going to continue to worship together. The last thing I want to say before we move on to another uh, series of worship is that uh, I want you to engage your hearts this morning. I don't want this to be a performance. I don't want it to be something that you're just watching on a screen somewhere. So when we sing, I want you to sing. And when we pray, I want you to pray. And when we open the Bible, I want you to get your Bible at home and open it together and follow along with us. The version notes are available, so if you want to use those, I encourage you to do that on your phone or iPad uh, and uh, follow along with us that way. It's going to be a great morning. Happy Easter.
hearts adore Him. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. When the wise bow before Him, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. See the sky. Sometimes people ask why. Why do we do this? When we came up here, I didn't feel capable. Because I was scared. Why do we take our families away from places that are familiar and move to places that are far off? My wife was nine months pregnant, and we did not know one person who lived in the city. Why do we come to where there's nothing so we can try and start something? The Lord really just, He broke my heart for this city before I stepped off the plane. Why do we stress and strain and struggle and sweat just to make life better for someone else? There's so many people that are broken, that are lost, and it's heartbreaking. Yes, sometimes people ask why, and when they do, we tell them. There's places where the truth hasn't yet reached. We need to share the gospel and reach out our community. We tell them there's a God who loves them so much, he sent us. God spoke to us, broke our hearts for the city, and God's call trumps all. And we tell them there are people who love them so much. They give so that we can go. When people give uh, to missions, things happen. New believers are getting baptized. New churches are started. So when people ask why, that's what we tell them. We tell them it's the gospel. It's all about the gospel. Hello, friends. 
My name's David. I'm the campus pastor at the church at Eastmont. Happy Resurrection Day. It is always a wonderful joy when the two campuses can come together to worship. You know, at FBK, we love the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And I have to say this. I kind of take it personally. The church at Eastmont is a recipient, along with hundreds, thousands of other church planters and missionaries all over North America. We are recipients of the generosity of God's people. So we want to say thank you. Thank you for giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. This year, between both campuses, we've set a goal of $25,000. And I have no doubt that between the two campuses, we're going to be able to meet that goal. So I want to thank you ahead of time for giving. You've been giving faithfully through this crazy season that we're in. You've been giving faithfully online and also by mailing your tithes and offerings into the church. And we just want to say thank you. A lot of folks have have asked the question to us, has ministry kind of shut down between the two campuses during this crazy time? And and we have to say no. We're busier than ever. If you can see the pictures on the screen right now, this week we were able to literally feed hundreds, hundreds of families uh, all over the Dayton surrounding area because of your generosity. Uh, I was able to, to watch you bring these boxes and bags of food in this week, and then we were able to deliver them to the needy families in this area. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for giving, not just with your tithes and offerings and the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, but but taking the time to go with all the regulations that we've been given by the government to go grocery shopping for some of these families in our community. It's my privilege now to lead us in a word of prayer. So let's just take our time right now, as Pastor Chad said earlier, We have our Bibles open. We're getting ready to worship him that way. But let's just prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Father, we thank you. Thank you as we've already heard sung this morning. Because you walked out of that grave, we are going to walk out of the grave. Because you're alive, we are alive. Father, we have hope because of the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ. So we just celebrate together as a church all over the place. I know we have friends watching not just from from the city here. We have friends watching from all over the world, really. And so we thank you that we can come together with the church and we can celebrate this beautiful day, celebrating the death, burial, and yes, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for demonstrating generosity to us first. The only way that we can be generous is because you were first generous to us by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for our sins, to pay the penalty for our sin. And Father, you didn't stay dead, as my son Toby says. You didn't stay dead. You conquered the grave, and you live. And because you live, we can live as well. We will walk out of that grave. So, Father, we worship you today. We celebrate life in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, and all of God's people say, amen. There was a young college girl who was driving home one weekend to visit her parents, and as she was driving through a small town, she was pulled over by a police officer. She was going 70 miles per hour in a 55-mile-per-hour zone. 
And the officer pulled her over. He uh, asked her for her driver's, and registra- driver's license and registration, of which she had neither. She left them at college. He gave her a summons to appear in court along with a ticket for $200. A few weeks later, the gar- young lady shows up in court and sits there in front of the judge. And the judge says, young lady, I see that you are going 70 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour zone. She says, I was, officer. I am guilty of that. He says, well, your fine will be $200. Uh, stricken and heartbroken uh, look came across the young lady's face, and she said, Judge, I don't have $200. I, I, I don't have anything close to $200. I'm a, a poor college student. And the judge said, well, you have broken the law, and the law says that I am to fine you $200, or you'll spend the weekend in jail. The young lady, with tears in her eyes, says, Judge, can you, can you please do something? Can, can you please show some mercy on me? I don't have $200, and I don't want to spend the weekend in jail. And the judge, again, looked at the young lady and says, But ma'am, you have broken the law, and the law requires that you pay $200 or pay for your infraction by spending the weekend in jail. The girl, again, for the third time, pleaded with the judge. She said, Judge, have mercy on me. I don't have $200, and I can't get $200. Can you please just show some mercy on me? The judge got up from the bench, walked over to the coat rack just beside the bench, took off his black judge's robe, hung it on the coat rack, picked up his coat to go outside, put that on, walked over to the young lady, pulled out his wallet, pulled out two crisp $100 bills, set them down in front of the young lady, walked back to the coat rack, took off his outside coat, put on his judge's robe, and sat back down. He looked at the young lady and said, Young lady, you are guilty of not obeying the speed limit. You owe $200. I see that someone has given you $200. Would you like to pay the court now? The young lady said, Yes, sir, I would. So the officer, excuse the judge uh, had the young lady bring the $200 off, and he said, because you have paid your fine, you are free to go. I tell you that story because it reminds me a lot about Easter, that somebody paid a debt we could not pay. Somebody showed mercy on us, that the God of heaven, sitting on the judge's seat, would send his one and only son, who would take on the form of a human, who would, who would get out of the black judge's robe and walk down to be our advocate to pay the price for what we could not pay. See, that's what Easter is all about. Easter is about good news. So this morning, as we are looking at the text in the book of Matthew, I hope that you're going to see the good news that Jesus brings. If you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. We've been going through the book of Matthew now for over a year. And one of the things that I love is when we're able to to work into the preaching plan, uh, a a place where we can continue right through a text at the most appropriate time. And I think as I read the text this morning, you're going to see that this passage in Matthew is a perfect text for Easter Sunday. So again, Matthew chapter 17, we're just going to cover two verses, but they're two of the most important verses that you will ever read. I'm going to begin this morning in verse 22. The scripture says, as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that it is true. Father, we thank you that we can turn to it and that it will faithfully teach us about who you are and what you've done for us. Father, I pray that on this Easter morning that we would celebrate the resurrected Jesus, that we would celebrate the new life that we have in Christ Jesus when we put our faith and trust in him. Father, my prayer for this morning is if there is anyone out there, Father, whether it's right here in Dayton, Ohio, right here in the United States of America, or somewhere around the world, that as we listen this morning to your word, that your spirit would begin to convict our hearts about sin that your spirit would begin to convict us about our desperate need for a Savior. And that, Father, your word and through the power of your spirit, we might see this morning that there's only one who can save us, and his name is Jesus. Father, I pray also that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable 
unto you. Oh, you are my rock and my redeemer. And I pray this in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, I want us to see that Easter is the gospel, and the gospel is good news. We were, in there, we were looking just a second ago there in Matthew chapter 17, and while that's just two verses, they're two very powerful verses, and out of those verses, I want us today to see four truths about the nature and purpose of the gospel. Four truths that if we will embrace them, if that we will allow our hearts and our minds to dig in and press in deep upon them, that, that God through his power and through the Holy Spirit can change your life and can change my life. Here's the first one. The gospel is good news for those who have the ears to hear and the eyes to see. The gospel is good news for those who have the ears to hear and the eyes to see. You see, some of you are watching this morning. Some of you are listening this morning. And in in 15, 20, 30 minutes when we finish our time here today, you're going to turn off the TV, you're going to shut down your phone, you're going to close your computer, and you're going to go on with your day. And what we've said and the the prayers that we've prayed and the texts that we've read, you're you're barely going to give it a second thought. And, And I would post to you this morning that if that happens to you, that perhaps you don't have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Perhaps the Holy Spirit is not yet working in your life in this area. But some of you this morning are going to wrestle with what we talk about. Some of you are going to think about it for the rest of the day. You're going to go to bed tonight, and as you lay in bed, God's Spirit is going to convict you. God's Spirit is going to speak to you about what His Word has said this morning. And so my prayer is that you and I would have the eyes to see and the ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us today through His Word. Look with me there in Matthew chapter 17, verse 22. It says, As they were gathering in Galilee... Jesus said to them, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know that uh, earlier in chapter 17, we see Jesus up on the Mount of Transfiguration with with, uh, Peter, James, and John. We see that Moses and Elijah have appeared. We see that they've now come down the mountain, and there was a a, a demon-possessed boy at the bottom of the mountain, of which the other nine disciples could not cast out. And so then we move into this latter part of chapter 17, and we see that Jesus has kind of regathered all of his disciples in Galilee. This is their home base. This is where they've done the majority of, your ministry, of their ministry. But this is a turning point. There's an important turning that happens here at the end of chapter 17 because it really is the conclusion of Jesus' ministry in the Galilee region. From this point forward, Jesus is going to turn his ministry to the equipping of the disciples in preparation for his death, burial, and resurrection in Jerusalem. And so he gathers them together, and here's what he says. He says to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Now this is not the first time that Jesus has told them that he's going to be killed. It's not the first time that he's told them that he's going to be buried and raised on the third day. If we look back a couple of uh, chapters earlier, we begin, begin to see that Jesus is preparing his disciples even prior to the conclusion of his ministry in Galilee. He's preparing their hearts and their minds. Why does he need to do this? Well, he needs to do this because the, his disciples were Jewish. And they, like many of the other Jews of the day, had this idea that the Messiah was going to come and that he was going to, to establish a reign. He was going to establish a kingdom in Jerusalem. That that he was going to act in a political manner. He was going to to control an earthly kingdom. That he was going to return Israel to to the power that it was under David. And so Jesus has obviously come for a different reason. He's come to set up a a heavenly kingdom. And so his disciples are, are having to unlearn what they had learned previously. All the things that they had thought the Messiah was going to be. Jesus is having to reteach them. He's having to re-equip their minds to, to think about him in a new way. And so we go back to chapter 13, verse 13. Jesus is going to talk about parables here. And here's what he says. He says in verse 13, he says, This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, their case, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. And so he's he's getting ready to teach the disciples and the Pharisees who are around 
what the parables mean. He's going to teach them about this new kingdom. And here's what he says. He says, some of you are going to hear this parable, and you're going to say, oh, I see what the kingdom is going to be like. And then others of you are going to hear me teach this parable, and you're going to miss the point entirely. Now, I say that this morning because, as I mentioned earlier, some of you are going to listen to, us, to this message this morning, and you're, you're going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your life, and you're going to, you're going to start to get it. And others of you are, are going to listen this morning, and you're going to move on with what you're doing. And, and I want to urge you this morning not to move past what God wants to say to you. Do you have the ears to hear and the eyes to see? Again, if we move forward just a couple of chapters to Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So here we see Jesus, chapter 16, already talking again to his disciples about what must happen, that his role as the Messiah looks vastly different than what they had understood it to be. Again, if we just move in chapter 17, a few weeks ago, we talked about this in verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, it says in verse 9, Jesus commanded them, tell no one of the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So Jesus, we see from, from very early on in his ministry, is already talking about what he came to do. That Jesus came to to suffer He came to die. He came to be buried in a grave. But listen to this, my friends, and this is the good news. He came to be raised from the dead. So the gospel is good news for those who have the ears to hear and the eyes to see. The second great truth I want us to see in the text this morning is that the gospel is good news for those who embrace the fact that Jesus died for them at the hands of men and by the will of God. That Jesus came to die for you. He came to die for me. He was put on a cross by his own people uh, under the authority and will and sovereign plan of the Heavenly Father, but carried out by the men of that day that Jesus was crucified for you and I. Look with me at verse 22. It says, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. He's about to be delivered into the hands of of the Pharisees, into the hands of the Sanhedrin, the ruling parties of Jerusalem in that day. And then it says in verse 23, and they will kill him. They will kill him. See, Jesus came to die. The purpose for his coming, the reason he left the throne room of heaven was to come to earth to die for your sin and for my sin. He was put on the cross but he was put on the cross willingly under the authority and sovereign plan of God the Father. We see this in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, where the scripture says, Then this Jesus was delivered up according to the, listen to this, definitive plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. So Jesus was put on the cross at the hands of men, but it is part of God's plan, the Father's plan in sending his Son that he would die for you and I. Romans 8, 32. He, God, who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us. That God the Father would not spare his own Son, Jesus, but in his sovereign plan gave him as a sacrifice for you and I. Or the beautiful prophecy of Isaiah. Several hundred years before Jesus ever came on the scene. Here's what Isaiah says about this. He says, surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken. Smitten by God. That word smitten there means beat down or punished. That God would punish his own son. That God would put his own son on the cross. That God would allow his own son to to die, to demonstrate his great love for you and I. Now, I have four kids. I have four kids that I love dearly, and I don't want to see any of them die. And I really don't want to see any of my four kids die for you. I love you. I care about you. I want the best for you. But I have a special love for my family, and you do too, right? I'm sure uh, you think of some people that you really like, but you like your kids 
even more. You have a deep and profound love for your kids, and you don't want to see any of them hurt or injured. But think about this. God so loved the world that he would give his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have eternal life. God loved you and God loved me so much that he would allow his own son, the scripture says, to be smitten and afflicted. It goes on, Isaiah says in verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. Meaning he, he took nails in his hands and in his feet. He, he had a crown of thorns thrust on his head and a spear jammed into his side. He was pierced for our transgressions. That word transgressions there means sin. The things that we did against the law and will of God. And so he was pierced for our sin. He wasn't pierced for his own sin. He wasn't crucified for his own sin. He didn't have any sin. He was perfect. He fully abided under the law and will of his Father in heaven. And then Isaiah says this in verse 5. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was crushed. You know why God allowed his son to be crushed? He allowed his son to be crushed so he wouldn't have to crush you and me. You see, just as we saw in that example I gave earlier in my message about the judge who stepped off of the bench in order to pay the price for the young lady who was caught speeding, that's exactly what God did for you and I. He sent his own son to come down and to pay the penalty, to pay the fee. What we owed, he paid for us. And so he crushed his own son in order that he would not have to crush you. He allowed his own son to be killed so that you and I would not receive the wages of sin which the scripture says is death. So the gospel is good news for those who will embrace the fact that Jesus died for them. Third, the gospel is good news for those who believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. You see, it's not good news if Jesus came to this earth and lived a great life, was a fantastic teacher. He, he could have even been sinless his whole life. And then he was crucified. It's, it, that's a great story, but it's not good news. You know where the good news comes in? The good news comes in at the resurrection. That sin could not hold him down. That the grave could not keep him. But he overcame our sin and death itself to prove himself victorious over all things. That, my friend, is the good news. Verse 23, Matthew 17, it says, And they will kill him. And he will be raised on the third day. Jesus does not leave that fact out. He doesn't tell his disciples, we're going to go to Jerusalem, and and I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to be buried in the grave. He says, I will be raised on the third day. This is a a theme that goes throughout the gospel. I don't have enough time here this morning to open up all of the letters of Paul. But if you just did a Google search and you just searched how many times does the gospel talk about Jesus being raised from the dead, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find that almost in every letter that Paul writes, in almost every letter that Peter writes, in almost every uh, uh, epistle that John writes, what you're going to find is that every time Jesus being raised from the dead is an essential doctrine to the gospel. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, Paul says, our hope, we have nothing to hope in, right? Because we too will not be raised from the dead. We too will not have eternal life apart from Jesus being raised from the dead. Here's what Paul does write, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen to this, verse 3. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance, not second importance, not third importance, not uh, afterthought, but he says, this church at Corinth I need you to know is the most important thing. He says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Listen, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. You see, Paul understands that you can't have death and burial, death and burial, if, and, and for it to be good news if you don't have a resurrection. So the gospel is good news for those who know that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And fourth, the gospel is good news for those who repent and believe. The gospel is good news for those who repent and believe. So 
So I don't know what you're doing right now. You might be getting a little restless, but stay with me here because this is so important. This is a matter of life and death for some of you today. And if you see it, hear a sense of urgency in my voice, it's because this is an urgent matter. This is the most important thing that you're going to hear all day. In fact, this is the most important thing you're going to hear in your entire life. And it's not because I said it. It's because God has said it. Look with me again. Matthew chapter 17. It says, and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. This is the heart of the gospel. If we go over and we start looking at some of the other gospels, the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1 verse 14. Here's what it says. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, gospel meaning good news, and he says, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, what does the word repent mean? The the word repent means I'm, I'm going in one direction, and this is how all of us are born. The scripture says we're all born in our sin and we're all headed towards, uh, towards hell and we're all walking that way. Some of us don't even realize it. Some of us are just pursuing the things that we know to pursue. Maybe it's just what our parents taught us. Maybe it's something we learned at school. Maybe it's just our own natural abilities to do certain things. But we're just walking casually along in life, pursuing nothing, pursuing ourselves, pursuing the world, pursuing a better job, pursuing Uh, women or men or relationships or whatever it may be and repentance means that while I'm going this way something stops me I'm I'm headed this way but all of a sudden something grabs a hold of my life and I and I turn and I, I embrace a new direction so sin is embracing your own will and repentance says I'm not gonna I'm not gonna keep going down that path I want to turn and embrace the the things of God I want to turn and embrace him. I want to turn my faith from myself and from my own abilities, from my own will to my own pleasure, and I want to turn and embrace what God has, who God is, what he's done for me in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to repent of my old way, and I'm going to turn to my new way. And how do we do that? Through faith, by, by believing that what God has for us is significantly better than what we were doing before. That God has provided a reward of heaven, a a reward of knowing Christ, a reward of a fulfilled and meaningful life. And we're turning from our own and we're embracing by faith what God has for us in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, there's the way Paul describes it. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin, right? Your own way, your own pleasure, your own thoughts, your own program. And what you were dead in that. It was, it was a one-way road to death. And he says, but, listen to this. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sin, and sin in which you once walked, verse 4, but God. That word, but God, those two words are so significant because what it means is that God stepped into your life. God stepped in and did something. But God, being rich in mercy. Remember that judge got down? showed mercy to that young lady, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us. You hear that? God loves you. God loves you. There is nothing that you can do that will make him stop loving you. He loves you. He sent his son to die for you. So he says, the great love in which he loved us Even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were in our sin, the scripture says, uh, he made us alive together with Christ. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. You hear that? It is by grace. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. There's nothing you could do to achieve it. But it's by grace that you have been saved. How do you receive that free gift of grace? Through faith. Not through works. Not through what being good, not by going to church, not by sending money, not by anything that you can do. You receive that free gift by putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. So he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift from God, not a result of your works so that none of us could boast. And then I'm going to share as we conclude our time together, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Listen to these beautiful words. 
for our sake. He made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Christ became sin for us. He paid the penalty for us so that we could receive God's righteousness. We were headed in our sin. We repented and put our faith and trust in Christ because of what Christ did for us. We now are clothed in his righteousness, not of our works, but of his grace. And Paul concludes that beautiful, beautiful passage in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, verse, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 2, when he says, In a favorable time, I listened to you. In a day of salvation, I helped you. And then listen closely. We finish with this. Behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. My friends, we probably all know of somebody at this point of this virus that has died from this or has become very ill or is on the, the brink of death. It's, it's so disheartening. It's so sad. Uh, many of these people were healthy two weeks ago. Many of these people were on vacation a month ago, and now they're in eternity. None of us know the day. None of us know when our time will come. And so I want to finish this morning by just asking you, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? If you were to die today, do you know? You might be thinking, well, I'm not going to die today. Ask some people who are in the ICU right now if a week ago they thought they were going to die next week. None of us know. And so today is the favorable time. Now is the time to decide. Will you put your faith and trust in Jesus? I want to pray a prayer. There's nothing magic about this prayer. It's all about whether or not your heart and your mind are trusting the Lord, about whether or not the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart right now. But if you want to trust Christ, if you want to repent of your sin and put your faith in the Lord Jesus, I want you just wherever you're at, whatever device you're watching on, I want you just to bow your head and pray something like this. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have done things, said things, thought things, had attitudes towards people, and I know that those things are sin. They have broken your law. And I know that the wages of my sin, what I have earned for my sin, is death. I deserve to die and spend eternity separated from you in a place called hell. I deserve that. I've earned that on my own. But, Father, today I want to ask for your grace. And I know that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, who died on the cross, was buried in the grave, and on the third day, he rose from the grave. And I want to put my faith today in him. I, I sense your spirit changing my heart from myself to you. And I, I want to put my faith and trust in you. I want to claim the promises of Christ. I, I want to walk in the power of his spirit. I want a new life, and I know I can't do it on my own. I need it to be from you. God, would you come into my life right now? Would you save a wretch like me? Father, I want to thank you for doing that. As I put my faith in you in this moment, I want to thank you for saving me from my sin. Now, if you prayed something like that this morning, I would love to talk with you. One of our staff would love to talk to you. And you can reach out to us by simply emailing us at contact at fbckettering.org or contact at eastmont.church. And those will be on your screen. But I want you to reach out to us. And all you need to do in your email is just simply say, I prayed that prayer. I asked Jesus into my life, and one of us would love to follow up with you this week. My prayer is that you'll have a great Easter, and that God would be honored in everything that you do, and that he would be honored in the way that you've worshiped him this morning. I hope that even though we're not gathered together in the, in the body, uh, as a body together, that even this week you will go out and be the church. My friends, the gospel is good news, but it's only good news if it gets there in time. We want to thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning through our online experience. Maybe today for the first time during worship you made a decision to place your faith and trust in Christ. We want to encourage you to let us know by leaving a comment in the comment section below or sending us an email. We also want to encourage you to join our online giving platform if you're looking for a place to give. And finally we want to ask you to consider and encourage you to join our online groups experience that will be taking place following this service this morning and throughout the week. The links for those groups are listed in the discussion section. We look forward to seeing you there. Let's go out and be the church.